the Principality of Wales did not encompass all of Wales. It did not even exist when Wales was conquered officially. It only lasted a few years, and yet it has defined Wales in the English imagination for centuries. That's not how we see ourselves in this nation. And to understand how that brief principality came to exist and what destroyed it, we need to go back to how it formed and go through that story. This is Benjamin and that's what this video is about for you today. Having survived the Norman onslaught, by the 13th century, there were four main powers in Wales. There were the Welsh Lords and the Marcher Lords, which encompassed two sides, very distinct and different, of a similar situation. Their job, pinned between the other two powers, was to survive. Their political allegiances culturally showed themselves quite often. The Welsh Lords very often sought to align with a Welsh power, but it was not always feasible if they wanted to survive and keep their own legal definition of being a lord. The English marcher lords, or Anglo-Norman marcher lords, they pulled more towards England, of course, but not always. Again, their goal was to survive. If you have a good position, why would you waste it? The two rivaling powers here were, of course, the Kingdom of Wales, or the Principality of Wales, and England, and the English Crown. Gwynedd slowly emerged, forming its domination over the Welsh lords, trying to hammer together a political state, trying to withhold doing homage to England when it could, but it couldn't always avoid it, trying to get recognition from England, as right to rule over these other princes, trying to get official title as the ruler of these lands, wrestled out of England. And the English crown, the fourth power, was constantly trying to reduce the power of all of these lords and princes to mere provincial lords directly answerable to the king. And the inevitable climax would come when Gwynedd was clearly resisting this order, trying to establish some independence of Welsh spirit and, crucially, law. And England, after a weak king, raised up a tyrannical, psychopathic king with imperial and homicidal ambitions. Part of the problem and the complexity of this era is that Gwynedd's position was ambiguous. They were above these lords most of the time. And England wanted them beneath England, but Gwynedd kept trying to reposition itself to be on equal standing with England. And, and so Gwynedd and England came to blows over this from the early reign of Llewellyn the Great at the start of the 13th century until the conquest of Gwynedd in the 1280s. Gwynedd's trying to get recognition of that title as being over the other Welsh lords with its own right to its own laws and not always having to do homage to England was not something an ambitious English king was going to be able to tolerate. The Prince of Gwynedd's purpose was to win permanent recognition of special status within the homage pattern of the crown to extend his power over Pura Wolia or Welsh Wales, and if he could, Lords of the March. Above all, to divert the homages of all Welsh Lords to himself. The Prince would then do homage alone to the King for his Wales. In practice, it meant more independence for Gwynedd than England was willing to contemplate. But Gwynedd was not willing to budge on its status and prestige either. The struggle was fixed by hard political realities around the year 1200 when an absent Richard and a John were locked in civil war over in England. Llywelyn Borwerth was able to take over most of Welsh Wales 
and to make inroads into the march and conquest. He went with Baron's opposition in England with France and with Rome. He took his wife John's illegitimate daughter and married one of his own daughters to Mortimer. This fusion would ultimately provide many Welsh strains of royalty, including the present Royal House of England. Llewellyn achieved a stunning success. By the time of the Magna Carta in 1215, he towered over Wales. The English Chancery gave him a special rank. Welsh chroniclers, not given to Oxbridge niceties, called him Prince of Wales. He became Llewellyn Vaur, Llewellyn the Great. Llewellyn the Great was in truth a very cautious man. He was careful not to anger the Anglo-Norman martial lords around the peripheries of his realm. He was increasingly and especially pressed to guard the inheritance and try and pass on a lineage to found a dynasty and harden the protected status of this emerging principality. Llewellyn's two sons were David and Griffith. David's half-brother Griffith, Mabagam Rice, the son of a Welsh woman, was illegitimate in English eyes, but not in Welsh. He moved heaven and earth to get his heir David, the legitimate David, into power after him, who was the son of an English mother who was a king's daughter and himself. This would have been very favourable. But the Welsh being so inclined to the laws of Hulah and favouring the rough and tumble raider type chose his brother Griffith often. And this person, Griffith's family, would have much influence later in this emerging principality. During a truce which lasted a generation, Llewellyn won the king's recognition of Davi in 1220. The Pope's confirmation of this disinheritance from Griffith in 1222, Davi. In 1226, the Lords of Welsh Wales recognised David, who did homage to Henry III in 1229, and married a martyr heiress. In those days, just because someone was your enemy didn't mean you didn't marry their daughter. Often, it was necessary. By now, however, Griffith was a bit of a hero to the old-fashioned war ban and foster brother Welsh running amok in the old style. Llewellyn jailed him in 1228 for six years. By 1238, Llewellyn's health was failing, and he entered into negotiations to extend the truce into a peace. A great assembly of all the lords of Welsh Wales was summoned to a third fleer, a Cistercian house. That he chose a Cistercian house is no coincidence. As mentioned prior in another video, this was more neutral compared to the church. In other parts, there were less likelihoods of English influence. But at this assembly in Estrad Fleur, he failed to get a complete unified agreement on David being his heir. Many of the Welsh wanted Griffith because he was on both sides of his family. Welsh, whereas David was half English, but legitimate in the eyes of their enemies. But many of us Welsh chose the heir who was illegitimate in the eyes of our enemies. So as soon as Llewellyn the Great died, his two sons went to war with each other. Now Griffith fled and he brought in the King of England on his side against his own brother and things went a bit bad. The special status of Gwynedd was revoked and many of the privileges of the Welsh lords removed as well. The Welsh lords rallied back around David and David pushed back and went to war again. In a long and hard war in the 1240s over two winters where David held his ground, he became the first Welsh ruler to formally proclaim himself Prince of Wales. It's a great tragedy that he died suddenly. We don't know why exactly he died, some health condition. But the English king did not go all the way and 
conquer Gwyneth at that point. It would have been too anarchic, too risky for him. So he divided up the land between the brothers in Welsh tradition. But in a few years, things swung the other way. England had lost Normandy and France and turned in upon itself. England broke into vicious conflict over the meaning of their own realm because they were not English, they were not French. Which one were they? They were becoming more English and that caused a backlash in their own country. We have to remember at this point that the English language was seen as a vulgar, pitiful patois by French-speaking London at this point. English was not an identity which was seen as in any way upper class or civilized or cultured. And there began to be a backlash in England against this. And into this, a rupturous civil war broke out. And out of this, a new Welsh ruler arose, the son of Griffith, Llewellyn Ab Griffith, who took advantage of the situation. It is at this point I had to make two separate videos, each completely a subject in their own right, out of this chapter in Gwynne Williams' book. Because he brushes over this period in our history at lightning speed, without seeing much value in the aristocratic princely order. He's quite Marxist in his views. So at this point, the next video will be the rise of Llewellyn Ab Griffith and the conquest of Wales. I could not compress all of this into one video. And even at that, both of these videos are very basic. May I take this opportunity to thank my Patreons. And for each and every one of you who like, comment, give a super like, anything. Thank you very much. We will see you next time with the rise of Llewellyn Ap Griffith and the Principality of Wales.